Greetings and welcome back to room 303. And we turn in your textbook now to David T. Hilburn's text, Hope. I'm with you on page 680. Um, hey, just to remind, back to 676, 677. We are working now in our textbook with four titles where we are comparing imagery. And we've already played around with Mary Tall Mountains, There Is No Word For Goodbye, and Naomi Shop Nye's Daily. And now we turn to David T. Hilburn, born in 1992. I'm, I'm reading now on page 677 to give you a bit of background here. Hilburn has been publishing his work since he was in the first grade. He wrote Hope after Hurricane Katrina of 2005 for his eighth grade English class. So in other words, what you'll be reading is a poet, writer, who is roughly the same age as you are as freshmen in high school. He says, I'm not sure yet what I plan to do in the future, Hilbert says, but I do want to continue writing in some fashion. Now, this is an interesting text, and here's why. Jot it down. Your prior knowledge will help you. This is a poem about a horrific experience, the hurricane that will have hit uh, Louisiana called Hurricane Katrina devastated millions and millions of dollars of property, but more significantly took lives and destroyed all kinds of, uh, of uh, people's lives. And the question was obviously, how do you survive a terrible situation? So write that down. That's the question. How do you survive a terrible situation? Some situations um, you know, are of your own creation. Other situations, you didn't create them at all. They just happen. And the obvious question is, how do you ever find hope? In our prose poem, and jot this down at level 2B, this is what we call a prose poem. When you look at it, it looks like an essay, but it's actually a poem written as prose. And we will see this occasionally um, together in our study of poetry, that poetry can look so many different ways. Okay, let's pay attention now. We'll go ahead and follow along in our reading. Just pay attention to the ways in which imagery is working, the powerful word pictures, especially at the very end. Hope by David Hilbun, Paul Bro Middle School, 8th grade. Adam, get behind me. His dad called over the roaring winds and splashing waves. Adam's reply was cut off by the crash of a huge oak tree being ripped out of the dirt and slamming into the ground a few meters away with the force of a stick of dynamite. Quick, into the storm cellar. The storm cellar had been designed by Adam's dad years ago. It was made of six-inch solid steel and had enough MREs to feed 12 hungry people for a week. They made it to the door and were able to get inside. Fretful, cold, and frightened, they got out of the storm. In their secret place, as Adam called it when he was littler, they felt strangely peaceful. Maybe it was the knowledge that they both were safe. Maybe it was the comfort of the cellar. They didn't know, but at least they had each other. Over time, the noise outside got worse and worse. At one point, it was so loud that it felt as if a huge gong were crashing inside their heads. Suddenly, the noise stopped. What's going on, Dad? Adam asked. I think the eye wall passed over us, he said. We can probably go outside for a little while. Outside was a scene of total destruction. Their house was gone a few planks in its place. The school was wrecked. The remains of an airliner strewn all over the football field, but worst, they saw a huge fallen tree. Sticking out from under it was a human arm. Feeling sick, Adam turned to go underground when the eye wall passed over. Hundred mile an hour winds lifted Adam into the air. Screaming, flipping over and over, he bid a mental farewell to his father and a mental hello to his mother. Crying, thinking all hope was lost, he was miraculously caught by his dad. Inch by inch, they made their way back to the cellar. 
where they waited out the storm. Finally, it was over. They looked around at the scene surrounding them in awestruck silence. Luckily, there were no bodies this time. Too shocked to cry, too scared to do anything but stand there, Adam and his dad looked at each other. After a time, the shock wore off. They walked around. Adam motioned his dad over. Look, he said simply, smiling. And there, amid all the destruction, was a single green plant. Now this is a compelling text for a couple of reasons. Let's put them in our notes. Obviously one is that this is a text written by an eighth grader. Compelling, right? But more even compelling than that is the way in which this text leads you to a certain understanding of the way life works. If poetry does anything, and I think it does, it speaks directly to the experiences of your life. For example, watch this. Jump to 3B and write down, what is the last time you experienced a really terrible situation? Maybe it was a natural catastrophe. Maybe it was something else. This young man experiences a terrible thing. He sees terrible things. And yet, notice the title of the poem. And notice the conclusion of the poem. And so we're going to ask some questions about the title of this poem and the very last line of this poem. What is going on? Of course, let's go ahead and work at level one quickly. You can reduce this text down to three simple movements. One, terrible storm, right? Hurricane Katrina. Two, there's a momentary pause when the father and the son, by the way, notice the son's name is Adam, which in the history of Western thought is a significant name. Why? Adam, of course, in Western understandings, the first person created, right? And so there's all kinds of interesting overtones to the fact Adam is the name, okay? Then, second movement, when there's a little bit of a break because the eye of the hurricane is over them and it's dead calm, dead still. Any of us that have experienced this know this is a really wicked, weird thing where you have all this intense wind and then all of a sudden it is so dead still you can barely, barely breathe. It's just dead still. They take a walk. What they see is devastation of a kind they've never seen before. What for you is the most provocative moment in that? Some students will say, you know, you look and you see this huge tree and it's over on its side and you can see a human arm coming out from under the tree, which obviously tells you someone died in the experience. And, and obviously we ask the question, why would any child ever have to see that and an eighth grader, right? And then all of a sudden the third movement, which is kind of a really freaky moment, when the child, the young boy is picked up and is going to be taken up into the air, the father will save him, and then they're back in the safety place, and then out they come to see, amid all of the destruction, a single green plant. With, of course, the title of the word hope, we now can begin at level 2A to make some observations. Let's make a couple of observations about possible themes messages here. The most obvious is, right, in the middle of the storm, in the middle of destruction, in the middle of the suffering and pain of life, we have to be able to find the single green plan. In other words, we have to be able to find the hope. In the middle of the worst of times, um, a second possible message here, and some students like to focus on this one, the young man feels okay when he is with his father. And his father is there to save him. By the way, did you notice the very subtle thing that when he's taken up into the air, he imagines that he is going to meet his mom and he's saying goodbye to his father, which tells you that he lives with his father but not with his mother. It's a very subtle kind of statement. Right? Finally, of course, a major message here is the challenge is to rebuild. The challenge is to live beyond the destruction, for example, of Katrina. And the ways in which to do that, you have to have hope. You have to have courage as well, don't you? Let's jump to 2B quickly. The imagery here is compelling. What for you is the most profound imagery that comes to mind? Especially that single green plant that's lying there. Notice the 
juxtaposition of the human arm underneath a fallen oak tree and then the single green plant that will grow possibly into another oak tree. Of course, the single green plant symbolizes what? Right there, of course, in the title, hope. We might say along with hope for your notes, we might say as well, perseverance, right? That notion that you have to keep living your life. You have to keep going. Sometimes when we're young, our tendency is to say, things get really bad, I'm just ready to be done with it all. And this text says, no, even in the worst of destruction, you have to find the hope. At 3a, what's your text of all texts that teach the power of a single green plant? What is that for you? What is the source of your hope? Do you have a text you come back to? Watch this. Do you have a song on your playlist that if you're having a really crummy day, that's, the, that's your go-to song? What is that song for you and why? And can you remember when you heard it for the first time? And can, can you remember why that song became such a powerful song for you? Or it might be a movie, it might be a video or a video game that you play. What is the text for you? What is the single green plant for you that gets you through? At 3B, what is your view about hope? We talked, of course, a 3A observation. We talked, of course, with Emily Dickinson's Hope is the Thing with Feathers, right? The little bird that sits in the storm. And we can easily join this text to that text. What is the single green plant of your life? What is it that you keep coming back to and say, okay, 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 things pretty crummy for me right now, but at least I've got this. At least I know this. Of course, the challenge of David Hilden will be throughout the rest of your freshman year, be looking for the single green plant because you know the hurricane, metaphorically speaking, you know that's coming. And the challenge is to live through and beyond the hurricane and find that single green plant. Well, thank you very much. I hope that that has challenged you to think a bit.